with another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Madi. And on today's incredible episode of The Spicy Life, I have something amazing in store for you. We're doing Love is a Balancing Act. And to join us, I have him in the G spot. That's a guest spotlight, Pastor Ture. Don't get nervous. <laughs> Pastor Ture is a best selling author, businessman, pastor, producer, and influencer of influencers. <laughs> so happy to have you on the show. You're going to be talking about your new book that just came out. Um, I have a ton of questions for you, but to warm you up, um, I asked this very spicy question. When did you first fall in love with yourself? Ooh, mm-hmm. wow. Give it to us. Um, I love it. I love it. Well, first of all, awesome to be on the show. Mine. Thank it's, you. Uh, I love what you're doing. Thank so you I would much. have to say um, it was after I went through my divorce. Mm. Uh, and I'm almost wondering if me falling in love with myself led me to finally uh, go through with it. But wow. I can, from a, from a practical perspective, I, I can see myself um, alone. Uh, and struggling at first because I didn't know what being alone, uh, you know, that I didn't know anything about that, yeah. but then settling into my me time. And I remember there was a song that, t- that, uh, Tori Kelly, uh, wrote back in the day called dear no one. And, uh, and it's a, s- such a powerful song. She's basically talking about loving being independent and that song resonated with me. So I would say it was either just before my divorce mm-hmm. Or right after my divorce, I fell in love with me. I love that you have a song that like goes with it. Um, what do you? What was that process like? Give us a little bit more like spicy details. Because um, if you fell in love with yourselves, that that means that there was a point where you weren't in love with yourself then. Um, yeah. So how did we get to that point? You know what's crazy is a lot of times you cannot be in love with yourself and not know it mm. because that that um, that lack of self love is cloaked by the love, the effort, the energy that you put out towards other people. Mm. And so, and so, and that's what it was like for me, particularly me being a pastor, you know, my, I'm in the business of love. Yeah. I'm in the business of loving on people and taking care of people. Uh, and so I think for the longest time, I, I was really good at that, but that was, it was a cloak. It, it was me hiding behind the fact that mm. um, I wasn't prioritizing myself. And so, so I think that, um, that when I finally started getting into me, uh, therapy and everything, realizing that you, you know you're, you're you're pretending you're doing good yeah. with love going in one direction, but not internally, and uh, and I think something something broke, and I've been in love with me ever since. Hey, that's what I love to hear. <laughs> Because it's not the easiest process, right? Falling in love with yourself, um, realizing everything that you have to offer, or just what makes you so incredible and special. Um, it's a process. And I think we're really hard on ourselves and we're always doing this comparison. And so I think that um, your book has some tools that we're going to speak on, right? When it comes to like giving yourself that self-love, that self-care that you need. Super excited to like dive into this with you. Um, but first, I just want to like, give the little backstory on it. You know, how did we decide that this was like a book that we needed and we needed it right now? Yeah. You know, I started writing this book in 20, the end of 2018, early 2019. And, uh, and it was supposed to come out in October of 2020. So the book is a year and a half delayed because of Mm. me, but the reason why, and I, and I'll tell you about that process, but the reason why I chose balance is because Balance is something that no one seems to be able to wrap their 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 arms around. So true. You know, there have been books about balance. You know, work life work life balance, mm-hmm. time management, or what have you. But you never hear someone say, "Yo, Marty, man, I am so balanced." You never hear that. You hear people saying, "I'm trying to find balance." Yep. And for me, I think that there is a solution. There's a way to overcome everything in the human experience. I truly believe that. So, so I always, if there's something that people are running away from, or even saying that balance is a myth, like some people believe, I took it head on. I said, you know what? I need it in my life. I'm gonna overcome it. And uh, and so I go on this journey of two years writing. It never takes me two years to write a book. But what I realized was that balance in 2019, hmm. pre-pandemic, yeah. is a completely different conversation than ba- balance through the Ooh, pandemic. So yeah. I had to discover balance when the world was out of balance. And I think that that's why it is so timely and powerful now is because it's a lot more deep, a lot more meaningful, and I think mm. a lot more helpful in this moment. 
I love that you were able to get it out though. <laughs> so yes. uh, all that matters yes. is that we got it out. Cause I'm sure we need it more than ever, but for those who maybe don't understand um, or even never, never even come close or touched balance, what mm. is your definition of balance? What does it mean to you? Yeah. You know, I think I'm going to start by saying what it isn't okay. uh, because, because mo most people think that balance is about learning how to effectively give pieces of yourselves to things that are important to you. And so, so your relationship is important to you. Your work is important to you. If you have children, your children are important mm -hmm. to you. Maybe it's nonprofit things that you're doing, humanitarian, all those things are important to you. So when most people approach balance, they say, okay, I got to figure out how to like divide myself up. You know, mm -hmm. I, how, how do I do all of these things well? And I think that that's why people get stuck. And I think that's why people fail at balance because balance is not about, you know, giving pieces of yourself. I can't give my wife, Sarah, 10% of me. I can't give my daughter, Ella, my son, Isaiah, my son, Malachi, 10% of me. I can't give my investors, my staff. I can't give, I have to give them all of me. So yeah. balance is not about learning how to effectively give pieces of yourself. It's mm -hmm. about learning how to become your whole entire self and then bringing yourself to every area of responsibility in sequence. Okay, love that. Um, bringing yourself, making yourself whole, right? Like bringing all of you full to every element, to break down the sequence. So yeah. when you say sequence, that means? So, so when I talk about sequence, I, I'm saying, so the goal is to become all of yourself. Balance is not a discipline. It's not. A, and that's where people mess up. They think that, OK, being balanced is a discipline, work, yeah. life, time management. But I have been disciplined in, you know, allocating time to chat, you know, to my kids, to mm -hmm. my wife, but not bringing my best self to those moments. And also and really finding it sometimes counterproductive mm -hmm. because what they need is me. They don't need a slither of me. They need that's all true. of me. Yeah. Right. So it's not a discipline. So balance is more of a state of being. It, it, it is me working. Ah several disciplines so that I, I can become all of myself, my best self. Mm -hmm. And now when I show up in my marriage, I'm showing up like, Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm lit. You know, she's got the man of her dreams. <laughs> I'm showing up to my, my kids. They're like, yo, dad, you come on, let's do this more. You know, I'm showing up in my staff meetings with innovation, yep. with creativity. Yep. You know, I, I'm talking to my investors. They feel good about me because wow, man, this guy is sharp. He's on his game. He's problem solving. And so it is about, so it's a state. And, and when you arrive at that state of balance, you do all things well. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're after, because because when we think about it, when people say that they want more balance, really what they're saying is I want to do all of these things that I am charged to do. I want to yep. do them well. I feel like if I'm out of balance, it means that, you know, maybe I, I got the relationship thing going, but the work mm -hmm. thing ain't rocking or maybe I got yep. the work thing rocking or the relationship. So it is a desire to do all things well. And you can if you become balanced. I'm 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 here with you. Um. I was always under the impression, right? And I think that um, society too was under the impression that balance is this juggling act of trying to make everything happen or make everything work. Um, and we think it's this like time management of like what you said of giving, you know, certain pieces or allotting this amount of time to certain things. Um, but what I've noticed is like, that's draining, right? It like pulls at you and you feel like you're not showing up as your best self. Talk to me a little bit about when you're saying um, that you are bringing your best self or that your wife is getting all of you or your children are receiving all of you, what's the secret sauce? How are you making sure oh. that you're not frustrated or you're not like overwhelmed from running to, you know, leading a service to now having to go to, you know, soccer practice? Like, how are you, how are you managing um, your way of being? Well, well, you're not your best self because you haven't prioritized self. Mm. And so, so when you look at your life as, see, here's the problem. Most people look at their life as a menu of responsibilities. Yeah. You know, I got this, I got that. I got to do this. I got to do that. And if your focus is to do all that, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? True. And the reality of it is you becoming, when you become you, your goodness springs out from you and yep. touches all those areas. And so, so it's kind of like, you know, it's not about everything. I'm learning. It's not about doing everything. It's about doing one thing and one thing amazingly and in sequence. See, when you're balanced, what, what I've learned is 
my, my kids don't need a lot of time with me. They need quality time with me. True. Right. So I could, they could see me every day. I could take them to the park every day, but if I'm not present, if yeah. the good me is not present, then they'd rather hang out with their, with their kids. And so, so you asked, how do you do it? So I, I think that the first thing you do to be a balanced person and let's call it a step, but maybe really it's not a step. Maybe it's the exact opposite of a step. I think it's a stop. Mm. I, I think you literally, if you want to be a balanced person, you have to have the courage to stop. And this is where so many people get stuck because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I used to think that it took a lot of faith to start something. And it does take faith to start something, start something new, a new career, you know, move to a new city, new job, whatever. It does take faith to do that. But it takes way more faith to believe that you can stop. Mm -hmm. And your world won't come crashing down. And most people don't stop. Like, it's like they keep going. They want to be balanced. They, they want to be whole. They want to be all of that. But they keep, they, they, they're just moving. You know, how, how, no one can, can become all of themselves if they keep moving. So I think the first step is to stop. Mm. When you stop, it brings you to a state. If you stop properly, it brings you to a state of awareness, right? Because most people don't know what's going on. Because life is so noisy, like yep. there's so many, like there's so many thoughts that come at us, Marty. We don't know what's Ooh. our thoughts versus the thoughts of everybody else. Yes, because because it's coming at us. And so, so how can I be me? That's the goal to be my best self. How can I be my best self when everybody is projecting their self into my consciousness? You know, I, I'm going through. You know, you scroll through social media, man, and you oh my get mad, sad, happy, <laughs> glad, <laughs> envious. You know, fired up, feel good. I mean, I mean, all that stuff. And so, so you got to stop, shut the noise down, come to a place of awareness. Now, why is awareness important? Awareness because it lets us know what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the book, I talk about the difference between self awareness, which I'm so glad everyone is seeking yep. and soul awareness as another level. Ooh. And uh, that's a whole other thing I'm, I'm talking to, but that's a whole other dimension. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I want to know what soul awareness is. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. So self-awareness, obviously we love self-awareness. It's yeah. about knowing what you're doing, why you're doing it, you know, and, and from that you can hopefully make better decisions. They Correct. studies show that people who are self-aware, yep. they excel in their jobs, have great relationships, et cetera. But soul awareness is another level. Soul awareness is like like self-awareness on steroids. It's mm. like it's like the deepest part of who you are, not just yourself, but your soul. And your mm. soul is your core. It, it's your base. It, yeah. it is, it is like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's center. It's who I am. And mm -hmm. here is the challenge. When you don't know the difference between self-awareness and soul awareness, your soul can long for something mm -hmm. and you will be trying to satisfy it with things that satisfy self. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so your song, your soul could be longing for something and you're yeah. like, okay, I need a new boyfriend or I need a new date <laughs> or I need a new drink or I need a new whatever. I need a little turn up, whatever it is, right? You, 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 because you haven't tapped into the fact that it's really your soul longing and, uh, and, and you don't understand how to one tap into that longing yeah. and then satisfy it. And, and I, and I do a great deal of talking about how to do that in the book. Oh my gosh. You guys, if he, you aren't sold on the book, <laughs> I don't know what else you need. Cause this is like, you are speaking to so many different things that I think, um, you hit on even earlier when it came to, um, first you mentioned stop, let's talk about stop before we even talk about soul. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I think to your point, that is extremely hard. I think that, um, when we experienced, um, COVID and quarantine, I feel like that was a real stop for the entire world that was unexpected, right? We were just moving. We were on autopilot. Um, for me in particular, that really speaks to me because I was at this place where I had in my mind, um, I wasn't going to have a kid until I starred as a relationship expert in my first show. Okay. That's just what like my goal was. And so I was like, I can't possibly have a family at this moment. The world ends, everything shuts down. And I'm like, what the hell am I waiting for? Why I'm building my empire as a relationship expert. And I'm not even gonna have a legacy to leave it to because I am so caught up in like these milestones that I want to hit. Fast forward, me and my husband decide we're going to get pregnant. We have a baby. I've been praying on it for a long time. Okay. Um, we have our baby. And two months later, I get my show. Wow. If, if that isn't like, stop, take a seat. And, <laughs> and listen, wow. like, listen to God, 
listen to yourself, like, listen, just listen, just mm-hmm. chill. Right. Um, so I feel like that is so important because like, we just keep running, we just keep running and we keep running and we never just allow ourselves to just be still and to just meditate on what we really need mm-hmm. and what's best for us. And I think we get so lost to your point, as far as, um, the distractions going on in the world, social media, all these things, people telling us how to operate that we forget who we are at our core. And I love what you describe as self-awareness versus soul awareness, um, because we can go to therapy all day long. We can, you know, um, try to unpack our childhood memories and, you know, um, all the things that, you know, have created who we are um, or who we believe ourselves to be. But unless we reach back into like our soul and the depth of, you know, what makes us love, what makes us fearful, like just understanding more about why, um, not just the self-regulation part that you had mentioned about like controlling our decisions, the better that we know ourselves, but understanding like our mission and our purpose. And I think um, that's extremely important to me at The Spicy Life. I help people um, connect with their purpose mate, right? And I think that that's what you're saying when you say soul connection, it's helping you understand that. And a lot of people can't meet their purpose mate because they don't have that soul connection probably. They don't know like their purpose and where they're going in life. Um, I just think that you have so much wisdom to give. And y'all, when I tell you that I've been um, with and following and loving on Pastor Teray, for so long from when he was in like a teeny weeny church in um, North Hollywood to when he went like big time mainstream over here in LA, like the entire um, stadium seating was gone. I was over in the overflow room trying to come to Sunday service. Like this is somebody who has really led me for a long time and led a multitude of people because he has so much information to offer that I know anything that he's writing or anything that he's putting out is definitely not just going to like help you grow, but to the next level elevation that you need in your life. Um, Okay. That's, I I said my piece. I'm going to just keep asking you questions now. (laughs) Wow. I appreciate those words. And I, and I love what you're doing. I I mean, you're talking about purpose mates. Yeah. I I believe in that wholeheartedly, you know, but you're right. You know, you, you can't find your mate if you don't find you. Yep. And uh, so I, I love that you're, you're, you're serious about that and you're creating an environment where people can find their purpose as powerful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to get a little spiritual. Can we talk about um, like what the Bible says about balance? Is there reference to or um, does it imply or insinuate that it's something that we need? Yeah. So, so I, I wrote this book for everybody. Um, okay. And as you know, my, my, my anointing, really my gift mm-hmm. is to communicate the Lord to the masses and to have language for the masses. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes what gets, mm, I won't say that get, what gets the church in trouble. I will say what, what lessens the effective, <laughs> I, I would say what, <laughs> what, what lessens the effectiveness of believers is they have a good message, but the wrong language. Mm. They don't, they don't know the language of the times and the language of the culture. Um, there's a, there's a passage that says in Proverbs, well, the wise King Solomon said, he who wins souls is wise. Mm. And what, and that does not mean that because you want a soul, that's what makes you makes you wise. It means that it takes wisdom to win a soul. And so mm. and and so and so balance, although it is a universal term and it has a universal context, it is extremely spiritual in its makeup as it relates to the Bible. So here's what the Bible says about Jesus. It says that he did all things well. So you kind of already see that in the title a little bit. He did. He did all he did all yeah. things well. And then there was another account, and this is where you have to kind of go with me a little bit, but they were accusing his actions. The the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders were accusing him saying, you know, what are you doing? And and Jesus says, I only do what I see my father do. Mm. He says, I only do. He says, I know what I'm doing is, is perfect because I'm only doing what I see my father do. So wait, wait, what are you talking about, Jesus? Essentially, what he's saying is, I am on earth aligned with who my father is in heaven. And so, and and he and his father were one. Mm -hmm. So he's basically saying, I am living out in earth, the highest version of myself that's established in heaven. And that's balance. So when I talk about balance in the book, not being uh, a discipline, but being a destination, a place, I'm talking Mm -hmm. about 
the highest version of you that's in the heavenly realm with God. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you yeah. and I ordained you. He's basically talking about two versions of you. <laughs> He's talking to one version of you about another version of you that he formed. And so balance is aligning in this life with who God created you to be there and it's just it, so it so to answer your question it definitely it, it's birthed out of out of for me biblical spirituality but it is like it's kind of like a parable a little bit it's like an allegory yeah. uh, even with the use of night in the scripture and how night comes and and night attacks and and night makes you feel a particular way well what is night night is darkness well who is the author of darkness so it's all there mm. but but i but i word it in a way that people don't get tripped up yep. off of language so that yes. they can receive the truth of the message and prayerfully find the God of the message. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, and you do have a way with words that I feel like um, it doesn't matter what you believe or what your faith is. Like it unites everyone because we can all understand it. You always put things in a way um, that I feel like does reach the masses. And so I know I'm, I know I already know that that's like <laughs> one of your other gifts as well. Um, cause you have plenty, um, the listeners that I have though, that, uh, really come to the spicy life, right. The spicy life, the podcast, and there's spicy life, my consulting firm, where I'm actually like coaching them. Um, the things that they have in common is that they all are these very career oriented, extremely successful people. But when it comes to relationships, they haven't been as masterful. Can you speak to how balance would help when um, we've got everything we want in life except for love? How could balance help in that arena? Love, love the question. So I know a lot of successful people, a great deal of successful people. And there is something that I have noticed amongst some of the successful people. Mm -hmm. I don't take issue with the fact that they work hard and are successful, but I do take issue with what is driving them. So, so some of the people that I know and some that are wildly successful are not being driven by optimism. They're, they're not being driven by optimism. They're not being driven by faith. They're not being driven by a curiosity about the possibilities of their lives. Mm. They're being driven by fear. Mm. fear, you know, that they're being driven by the fear of not having enough, the fear of not measuring up to a parent, to yeah. society or what have you. And, and one might say, well, so what, if we're wildly successful, then what does it matter? Uh, what's driving? Well, a couple of things. One, when, whenever negativity and fear is a negative emotion, yeah. whenever negativity is driving there will be sometimes in the long term, there will be loss. Um, studies show that that when you ruminate on negative things, so fear is driving you and you're you're succeeding because you're afraid of what might happen. Mm -hmm. That's negative rumination creates protein deposits in the brain, protein buildups in the brain, which is what leads to early dementia. Mm. So you might feel like you're outrunning. Uh, maybe even people that are around you that seem to have more of a balanced life, but one day you're going to stop and you're going to look up and you'll realize you missed out on something. Mm. So to the person, and of course that's not everyone, but to mm -hmm. the person who, who can't seem to get relationships, right. Mm -hmm. They, they get work right, but they can't get relationships, mm -hmm. right. They're acknowledging one that they want a relationship, mm -hmm. you know, that, that they want this to happen. So, you know, is, is it, cause it may not be the career, you, you know, it just may be coincidence, you know, uh, correlation isn't causation. They might think that, you know, that it's about the career, but maybe it's not, maybe it's about stopping and, and really asking yourself some of the, the hard questions. Maybe, maybe you're afraid to be alone. Maybe work for you is, is a cover up for your lack of the love of self. Mm. Oh God, I, I can talk about that forever, but it could be, you know, I know what it's like to be immersed in work mm -hmm. because I don't want to sit alone with myself. Mm. And, and, and that is a sign of the absence of self-love. Well, if I don't love myself well, I will never be able to present to a potential mate, spouse, a partner mm -hmm. that I even have enough love. If I don't have enough love for me, 
<laughs> how am I going to create space for them? If right. I don't create space for self-love, then how can I create a space for romantic love? Are you tired of being alone? Or maybe you feel like you're on a merry-go-round attracting the same toxic relationships over and over again. Maybe you're even having trouble making the first connection with someone. If meeting a passionate and powerful partner feels daunting for you, then chances are the spicy life can help. I'm offering the spicy e-course, Your Purpose Mate Awaits, which not only educates you on how to connect more effectively, but provides you with the tools to date and form relationships with success. The spicy e-course is a six week online curriculum with weekly live virtual classroom sessions led by yours truly, Spicy Mati. The e-course is based on the spicy fundamentals, which stand for self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. You will learn how to conquer your fears, eliminate insecurities, and shift limiting beliefs around love and relationships. If you're ready to unlock the power of your passion to attract your purpose mate, this is the class for you. Go to thespicylife.com backslash e-course and register right now. One thing that I talk about in the book also is I don't necessarily know if we should also obsess over a relationship. Um, and I was going to say until, but I don't think that we ever should. I think that mm -hmm. we should first embrace the beauty of being alone. Now, somebody right there just logged off. Someone said, oh, <laughs> you know, like, Marty, I up, like this up, dude. Hold up. <laughs> I, I liked him for a minute, but now, no, he's saying I need to embrace being alone. No, no. Let, let me break down why being alone is so important. First of all, alone has a negative connotation to it, right? We, we, even when I say alone right now, you know, you can almost hear the, 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 the piano playing and the, and, and, and the sad music coming in alone. Yeah. You know, you go to a restaurant, <laughs> you go somewhere and right. The, the violin is hitting right now. You know, you go to a restaurant, you're there with your friends. You see this poor little person, this poor little lady, poor little guy over in the corner alone all by themselves. So we are wired to think that alone is bad. But here's the thing. That word alone comes from a Latin phrase, al ana. It's two words that make up a phrase, al ana, and it literally means all one, mm. all one. So alone was never meant to have any sort of negative connotation to it. It was really positive to become all one in a fragmented society. Uh, when you scroll social media and you go through all those range of emotions, mad, sad, happy, envious, proud, all this sort of stuff, that's the fragmentation of self. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of stopping and, and getting alone is you get to become all of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then when you become all of yourself and you are good with yourself, then that is when you are ready to offer yourself to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so, so maybe maybe work is the issue, but maybe it's not the issue in that you're too busy for a relationship. Maybe you're too busy for yourself and, and you need to, to pause, stop, take time out, get with you, fall in love with you. There is yeah. something incredible about you. You're, you're a mystery. I, you know, people, you know, um, we talked about it when we first got started and, mm -hmm. and people are so hard on themselves, but man, you're a mystery. Look in that mirror and, and be curious about you. You were made in the image and the likeness of God. You need to be in that mirror, like pinching yourself. Who, who am I? And then when you make a mistake, here's the thing. When you make a mistake, don't penalize, ponder. Mm. Think about it. You know, I, I've got this saying, never waste a perfectly good failure mistakes and failure. They're there to teach you. Do an autopsy yeah. on your mistake. Do an autopsy Ooh. on your failure so that you can glean the insight and the wisdom to make you a better you. Mm. Okay. What he is saying, y'all have heard me say this before. Okay. Pastor Trey is hitting on the money. Um, I have everybody who listens. Um, I'm constantly talking about doing a SWOT analysis on yourself. Mm -hmm. What are your strengths, right? We want to pump ourselves up. What are our weaknesses? Like, what are the things that we don't do so well or that people like, you know, don't like that we do? What are our opportunities for growth? Like, what can we do with those weaknesses and improve upon? And then what are the threats? What's the worst case scenario if I don't work on these things that I'm not crazy about? So it sounds very similar to what you're saying right now. Like really sit in that moment um, after a breakup or after a job loss or after something and figure out like where we can grow from it. And instead of taking it as a loss, let's take it as a learning lesson, right? Absolutely. There's a difference between losing and being a loser. 
There's a mm. difference between failing and being a failure. A failure, if you see it right and you posture yourself right, can catapult you into a dimension of greatness and impact beyond your wildest dreams. Most amazing people. In fact, I can't think of an amazing person that I know that didn't spring back from a failure. I love this. Um, <laughs> I, Pastor Ray, like this is going to be one of my favorite episodes by, by far. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about balance and like the chapters, right? I noticed that you had um, it broken down. I just kind of want to like hear um, what we can expect from each one. Um, the power of no. Why is no so important? Like, <laughs> what can we expect from this? That's one of my favorite chapters. I only it's like good. the hearing the word yes. <laughs> I only want yes. <laughs> I know. <for> this, okay. <laughs> I know. I feel you. We we all do. But the reality of it is, you've got to get comfortable with no because no protects your yes, and your yes is expensive. Mm. When, when when you say yes to something, you're committing your time, you're committing your energy, you're committing your availability. You're you're there is a lot in your yes. It's easy to give because. You know, you've got the instant gratification of approval when you yep. say yes, when somebody asks you something. So that's, you know, do, you know, your, your dopamine kicks in, mm -hmm. you know, endorphins, you good. feel good. It was good. But then what happens when you gave that yes, and then something that you've been praying for, something that you've been studying for, something you've been working hard for shows up and you can't give it a yes because you gave a random yes down the road somewhere. And so, so yes is important. No is important because your yes is expensive. I also like no, because no protects my purpose. It protects my, my, it, it puts boundaries around my purpose. So mm, when, when I understand, that's good. when that's I understand good. where I'm headed and we, we all should understand where we're going, or at least you don't have to have every detail. I'm not that guy, but you should know what the parameters are pertaining to what you are trying to accomplish. Okay. So when you have parameters, those are boundaries. No is a boundary. No says, oh, no, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. No, I can't commit to that because I have allocated that time, that season, that energy, your limited resource. Can't say yes to everything because there's only so much of you. And so, uh, you know, no is critical. Here's another thing I like about no. No will qualify your relationships because there's That's some relationships. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> like, like some some relationships only work because you say yes all the time. So you can't even tell whether or not the, the relationship is legitimate because you never say no. So yes. every once in a while, you just you should just throw a no out there. Every once in a while, just <laughs> say, let me see what we got here. Because if someone loves you, they're going to respect your boundaries. They're going to want the best for you. And they're going to respect your strategy for getting to where you need to go. Okay, next one, because that was so good. Um, there's no team and I. Why is this chapter important? I love it. And obviously, that's a that's a play off of the popular mm -hmm. phrase, there's no I in team. I, I wanted to break this notion that um, that prioritizing self is the same thing as being selfish. That, that's completely not true. Yeah. You know, you, you, I, I used to struggle when the you know, when you be on the airplane, they tell you, you know, if there's an emergency, then, you know, bring the, you know, when the thing, the mask comes down, yeah. the oxygen mask, put it on you first. And I'm thinking, I got kids. No, that's something I'm going to put it on my kids. Mm -hmm. But no, I need to put it on me because if I'm good, I can make sure that my kids are good. Yeah. So it was to to break. It was to give people tools and insights to break this notion of the idea that being good to yourself somehow is selfish. It's not selfish. It's what I call being selfful. You're being mindful mm. of self. And it's actually one of the best chapters of the book. Ooh, okay. Y'all heard it. He said it's the best. So um, you need to make sure that you're reading it. Um, the five signs of imbalance. I love it. So if people are saying that, you know, I need to find balance, you know, I'm out of balance. In essence, what they're saying is mm -hmm. that balance has actually become the norm. And anything that becomes normal is very difficult to detect. And so, so I laid out five, and that could be 20 things that, that will reveal to you they're out of balance, but, but five, one of the, the five common um, areas that pinpoint that you're in balance and those are stagnation. You mm. feel stuck. You can't move. I talk about that and how to get out of that. Um, loss of clarity. You, you lack of clarity. You don't have clarity anymore. Yeah. That's gone. Uh, declining thought life. You always skew to the negative. That means that you're out of balance. Um, jealousy and envy is another one. You can't mm. be excited. You can't celebrate yeah. progress when you're stuck. 
you know, and so that's a sign that you're out of balance when you can't celebrate progress because it's not on you, it's on somebody else. Uh, and then weariness is a big one. Uh, and there's a difference between being tired and weary. I like to call weariness, I define it in the book as the gradual gravitational pull down to the tarmac of disaster. So it is <laughs> gradual. I know that's a lot. <laughs> But, but, but you just know that when you get, I ain't talking about being tired, tired, you get you a nap, you'd be okay. When you're weary, just know you're going down. Your productivity is going down. Your innovation is going down. Your patience is going down. Your relationships are going to suffer. Your decision-making is going to fall off. You're going to, there'll be lapse in judgment and lapse, perhaps even in integrity. Uh, and so weariness is a sign that you need to pause, stop and get back to balance. Mm. Ooh, um, you got a bunch of people now questioning, like, I thought I was tired, but I might be weary. <laughs> um, people are second guessing themselves now. Um, and then the next one, balance after the blow. What is this one? What can we expect from this? That that one, I, you know, I, I say it about every chapter. That one is definitely one of my favorites. <laughs> this one's the you favorite, know, favorite, favorite. <laughs> yeah, this one is, is crazy. So life happens to us. All of us, we, we, we're not exempt from life's blows. And the reason why I call it a blow, a blow is different from something bad happening necessarily. A blow is when you get the wind knocked out of you. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID-19 knocked the wind out of the world. You know, so many things happen. And so balance after the blow, I give you step-by-step -step process mm. to get back to regain your equilibrium. Some people get a blow. Some people get damaged and they never rebound. They never trust life again. They, they never get over it. They are permanently damaged by a thing. And I, and I give practical steps to show you how to not allow that to happen, but to trust life again, because as long as you've got breath in your body, we have not seen the finest work of you, nor the finest work that I believe God has in store for your life. I love that you speak to trust in there. I think that's a huge one that, um, not only like hurts, but holds people back um, when it comes to being able to move forward. So um, I know that that's one that y'all, you guys ask me questions about trust all the time. So if he's saying that that's being mentioned in like how to recover from that blow, um, you guys definitely want to check out that chapter. We got to get personal because um, okay. this is the spicy life. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, I want you to give me the juice. How have you applied balance? And I want it specific to you and Sarah. I want it specific to mm -hmm. your love life. Um, how has balance been applied to your marriage? What have you um, instituted? What have you um, done to create a balanced relationship with your partner? Amazing. So, so Sarah is my person. Like I, I love this woman, you know, you, you hear people say maybe not so much anymore, but you like the old ball and chain when they're referring to their partner. No, it ain't. I, I, I miss, I love her so much. I miss her when she is asleep. Mm. Okay. It, it, it's like that, you know, and yet both she and I need alone time, mm -hmm. you know, need, need time away. So it's back to, there's no team and I, and so, so at first we both were like silently knowing that we need time just to us. And here's the thing. It doesn't have anything to do with the other person. You know, me needing alone time is not me trying to escape Sarah and her needing alone time is not me trying to, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what our soul needs in order for mm. us to be the best version. So we were kind of like, almost like closeted needing time away, <laughs> but we would never say it or, or we would do it and it would be kind of difficult to do. And we feel guilty or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, even like writing this book, you know, and, and revealing how there was, uh, I don't want to go too long with this, but there was this, we, we had this vision of, we saw a couple riding a motorcycle, riding motorcycles and they looked amazing. They had leather, they were on Harleys. Like it was, whoa, they were like, they were turning in sequence. The hair was blown in the wind. It was dope. You know, I'm like, oh, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And so, uh, so I stuck with it. Sarah didn't. So I ended up buying a motorcycle and I what? started riding. <laughs> I, I bought a motorcycle and I thought she was going to come along because the whole vision was me and her doing it together. Right. So I start doing it and it was amazing. And at first she would kind of ride with me. She didn't get her own motorcycle, but she would ride in the back of mine. And she did it a couple of times and she stopped doing it. And so I'd be like, babe, let's go ride. She's like, I don't feel like I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ride. And I would have an amazing time. And, uh, and I started feeling guilty because, Hey, here is this thing we said we were going to do together. Now I'm doing it and I'm having this amazing experience and uh, I started feeling guilty. And then mm. I got delivered from that mentality because 
I noticed, and she also noticed that when I came back from writing, I was, yo, I was this incredible recharge. (laughs) I'm patient, baby. You want to go out? What do you want to (laughs) do? And so, and so we realized that, yeah, it's a sacrifice. And of course, riding a motorcycle for a few hours is different from taking a few days off. But the principle is we learn that if we give each other those two or three days that we need, yeah. We actually are the benefactors in allowing us, you know, yeah, hey, I miss you. It's cold. The bed is cold. But you know what? You're getting what you need. And when you come back, I'm going to have a better version of you and vice versa. So we we believe in balance. And we take now, you know, every six weeks, every, you know, tw- oh. you know, every uh, six to nine weeks, we're taking a day or two and we're going away, staying in Santa Barbara, or Newport or somewhere like that. And and uh, so we believe in it because at the end of the day, we want to be the best version of ourselves. And we can't do it without doing these steps that lead to balance. I love, love, love that. It's so important too. And it also gives you and your partner opportunity to miss one another, right? So like you get this alone mm-hmm. time, you recharge and you're not hundred percent up underneath each other. So yes. you're learning new things, you're discovering things. And now you have something to take back to your partner to actually share versus every single memory <laughs> being like the exact same. Um, exactly. it, it really creates more passion in the relationship. Love, love, love this. My last one for you is for people who let are me, struggling. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let me let me add something. I, I want to get to that because you mentioned trust, and, and I I want to make certain that I because it takes trust to do that. You know, it takes trust to that let part. your your partner go out to a hotel away from you for for three days or however long it is. And sometimes, if someone has been burned in the past. You know, they can be trying to hold on and not allowing that and ultimately damage the relationship. Yep. Trust is a decision. And if you're going to be in relation in a relationship, you have to make a decision to trust. And the last thing I'll say, I'm going to get to your last question is <laughs> love. Let me tell you something. Love is expensive and love is risky. Yeah. And if you want love, you have to trust in such a way that you risk the possibility you don't have to ruminate on it, but you risk the possibility of being hurt again. But let me tell you something. And that the notion of being hurt again, particularly if you've been hurt, like for real, for real, can be unthinkable. Mm-hmm. But man, the reward on the other side, if you choose well, and I believe that if you if, if you're balanced, you choose well, mm. the reward of that level of trust and that level of openness and availability, oh man, is going to be so much greater than what you had before and so worth the version of you that you have to become in order to allow that freedom. I just wanted to say that because you, trust is a part of it. You, you, you just went into something that people are going to be screaming at me. Like, can I get you a couple more minutes? Like, so, so that I can ask you um, something pertaining to what you just said. Um, how are you looking mm-hmm. on time? You can keep it, keep it real um, with me. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's be a blessing to the people. Okay, Come on. please. Let's go. So yeah. one of the hugest questions that I get when I get couples who have struggled with infidelity, cause you just, you went there. So now we got to go there, right? Mm-hmm. When it comes yeah, to it. trusting, yeah. allowing our partner that freedom um, or back their liberties, right? Um, mm-hmm. Cause we take it away. We want to control the situation cause we've just been hurt and somebody uh, has betrayed us. Maybe they were dishonest or maybe they um, cheated, Oftentimes couples will not let them have that alone time. They won't let them go on the bachelor um, weekend with their friends. They won't let them travel. They won't let them um, stay out late with the boys or, you know, or the girls, whomever, you know, is the betrayer. Um, And you're speaking on like, you know, but choose balance, choose wisely. What would you say to those people who are still hurting and struggling with releasing um, those reins and allowing that person to go? Because most of the time people feel uh, like they need to control the situation. They feel like Mm -hmm. the person hasn't earned the trust back to be able to separate from them. What would you say to them? Totally understand that and empathize greatly with that. I want to give a harsh truth. Okay, go for it. No matter no matter what you think, you cannot control another human being. You can suppress, which actually works to your disadvantage. You can mm-hmm. suppress someone, but you can't control a person. I, I I love my wife. My life is my wife is amazing, and I and I trust her. I love my wife, but I can't control her. You know, at, at the end of the day, she is a human being with a will and a soul. And it's just important that you do your best to choose someone 
that you can trust. You cannot control. Uh, so I would say to that person, you're going to have to decide. You have to make a decision mm-hmm. if you have it in you to trust them again. Mm. And 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 you can't you can't trust and and meditate on what they did before and what they can be. That's torment. And sometimes mm. I'll be honest with you. If you don't have the grace to do that, you're going to have to walk away from the relationship. If, if, if the only thing that you see when you see that person is what they did and you can't get past that, you got to let them go. You got to yeah. let them go and let yourself go heal, you know, so that you don't bring that same mentality into another relationship. And uh, and that's just a, that's just a fact of life. I I think that you can get back to trust. I really mm-hmm. do. I believe, I believe that it, too. If it's, if it's the right person, you know, sometimes the right person does a wrong thing, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, and you have to really, I, I think you have to pray about it and, and really try to figure out, make a decision, be honest, get whole, get healed. Um, and you can get to trust, but if you cannot, and you've done everything that you can to get to trust and you just can't do it, then you need to free that person and free yourself and get the help that you need so that you can have a healthy, vibrant relationship in the future. Oof. Look, some people are upset right now. Some people are happy that they heard that, but a few people are upset. Like, so you saying I might need to leave him or I might need to leave her. Um, he, he's going to keep it 100 with you. Okay. This is, yeah. this is what he does. Um, but he wants the best for you. I believe it. Um, cause yeah. let me tell you a few times I've been, um, uh, crying at your altar <laughs> mm-hmm. back in my day, back in my day. Now I'm happily married, mm-hmm. but there's a few times yes. I was up at your pulpit crying and uh, needing hands <laughs> laid on me. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my last question for you was for people who are with a partner who doesn't have balance, right? They feel like they don't give me enough time. Um, there isn't a balance. They're not spending enough time maybe with the family or, you know, careers for priority, or maybe, it, maybe it's the mother-in-law is the priority. Um, how would you suggest that they encourage their partner to find more balance without sounding nagging or confrontational, or as if they're complaining all the time about what the partner is not doing? I love it. I think the communication in a relationship is everything. I mean, talk about it all. Nothing is off limits. Why have a relationship that you can't bring your authentic self to? And so, and so I would do it, and to your point, not in an accusatory way, but you're discussing your needs. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong with in a relationship discussing needs. Uh, not to the point that you are making the other person responsible for your needs. It's not that. It is just you coming to the table and saying, you know, when I look at what what makes me feel good, what makes me feel loved, what makes me feel valued, this is what that looks like to me. Because here is the thing. If you don't talk about that, that person may very well believe that he or she, that they're demonstrating love in, in another way. And so they're like, man, I thought that I was, I, I thought that you knew how I felt about you, but you know, it's back down to the five love languages. You know, yeah. I, I, I knew what I felt about you, but, and I was giving this to you, but wow, you didn't see it that way. So I think it's about communication, you know, and, and then if it's about balance, I think you have to model it too. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to model that, that, that you're balanced, that you're taking balance seriously. Mm, the modeling uh, part. <laughs> you got to model it. You, sometimes we, we, we make demands on what we won't model. And so, so I think it's modeling it. I think it's honesty. And I think it's, you know, I have this phrase and you've probably heard me say it about th- thinking the highest thought. Um, I I just, I know how the mind can play tricks on you and Mm -hmm. make you make something out of nothing. So I would rather not play the mind game. I would rather think the highest thought than be wrong and be wrong than to think the lowest thought and be wrong. So Mm. when you come to them, uh, we're not attacking, we're not accusing. We're thinking, you know what? I know you love me. I I know you care about me. I, I, I am not at all, uh, delusional about that or saying that that you know, that, that I, I'm not confused about, it. I know you love me. And I just want to express to you that this would really help me. I know that you want to give me love. I know that you want to give me attention. Here's what I'm going through. I don't, I don't want to keep this from you. Let's talk about it. And it's a conversation. It's not nagging. It's not, this is how it's got to be. It's a conversation. And particularly if it's a guy, guys don't want to be you know, and I'm generalizing whatever, because I completely get that. But guys don't want to feel like they're failing. Mm -hmm. We are heroes. We, 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 man, we're, we want to know 
that you guys are covered. And so if you come and you're attacking me and telling me I ain't this and I'm not doing enough of that, we're going to shrink because by by just by nature, almost our job is to protect you. So so, you know, and maybe you can even say that, baby, first of all, and, and then get the get all the positives out first. He's Maybe saying affirm this well. first, ladies, yes. affirm first. <laughs> yes, yes. Get the positive. Stuff. Baby, you do. That. It's incredible. And I know you love me, you know, and then let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you something else. We are, we are, uh, we are a suck. We are suckers for the damsel in distress. I mean, we are total suckers. So, so instead of <laughs> nagging, it's like, baby, and rub the chest if you got to, baby. <laughs> I just sometimes, you know, when you're gone, I just feel, you know what I mean? Like work it, make me feel like, <laughs> like I'm Popeye and you're olive oil and I'm about to eat my spinach and bless your life. <laughs> and if all that doesn't work, uh, leave balance on the coffee table. Okay. Leave the book on the coffee table and be like, just nudge it over to him. Like I was thinking we could read this together. Um, you were exactly. given so many, you're actually giving really spicy tips, um, stuff okay. that I would suggest. So I love this. Um, he, he, we're in alignment, Pastor Jure. We're, we're, we're on the same, on the same track. Um, Absolutely. I have to let you go, but yep. I, I can't help but to ask this question. Please, please, please. This is my last one. I swear to okay. goodness gracious. Okay. Um, we're, we're speaking good. about balance and this is something that I've been, my friends are going to appreciate this. Me and my husband are appreciate this because I've been in constant debate about this and I want to hear your theory on it. Let's talk about imbalance. Um, and this, yes, is this pertaining to the church? I really just want to know why do we see, or what is your theory on why we see an imbalance between women attendees and male attendees? Oh, that's, that's easy. Uh, because women typically, have the there it's easier for them to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and to acknowledge their need for spirituality mm. their need for god mm -hmm. um you know i mean even you think about worship you know worship particularly we know worship is not a physical exercise but when you see worship you know the ladies are they're, they're at the altar their arms are stretched out wide they're like oh jesus have me <laughs> you know and the <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the men are kind of like, you know, one hand might be up or they might wave or do something like that. <laughs> you know, in my in my humble opinion, I just think that that guys um, have a difficult time being vulnerable. They have a difficult mm -hmm. time being seen. Uh, and in churches, especially churches like ours, and we have a pretty good balance. But but it's we don't want to be seen, uh, you know, and then. Um, yeah, but I think that the main thing is that vulnerability piece. I, mm. I think that because we as men, we, we want to build stuff. We want to mm -hmm. we want to provide. We want to make sure we 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 may not even want you trusting. And sometimes men get jealous of God. Mm. You're at church all the time, and you talk about God all the time. You talk about the Lord, man. You talk about me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm over here working. <laughs> you know, but no, but I, I but I think more than that, it's really about. Uh, it, it is easier. It appears to be easier for women to acknowledge their need for spirituality and their need for God than it is uh, men to. Mm, okay. And this is just, I appreciate that. I had to get that one out because my friends and I are always in, you know, just having debates about that um, because oftentimes people are asking for males to be the spiritual leader in the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and so they want to go to church, right. And meet someone. And um, yours in particular is actually one church was always popping. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a hot <laughs> spot um, and it did have a good balance. Yeah. But there's all these other churches where we do see a huge imbalance. And so out of curiosity, I had to ask that question because yeah. um, it just seems like um, and it could be to the feminine energy of us, you know, willing, like you said, to like release um, and be open and men being mm -hmm. more protective and guarded. Um, so I do think that that was like a great um, rationale or explanation. Um, but I had to ask you, I was like, oh, you would know, you would know. Um, so thank you for that. I want everyone to be able to get the book. I want them to be able to find you, um, uh, everything uh, with your church, any updates that you have going on. Um, please give us all your social handles. Let us know like everything that we can support. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, well, you can get the book at thebalancebook.com and all the book information is there, thebalancebook.com. And then I'm on, I'm everywhere at, uh, at Torre, T-O-U-R-E. Roberts at Torrey Roberts. Uh, but I'd love to connect our churches one dot online. It's pretty easy to find. And, and uh, we've got a lot of exciting things happening all the time. Great community, great people uh, like Mari. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now, look, <laughs> who 
Ooh, one church. You guys, I, I'm sorry, but I just gotta say, you have saved me so many times. And when I say save, I'm not talking about save me like um the way that God has saved me. I'm saying yeah. like there's been so many moments prior to my marriage where um I was going to service actually just to feel better, to feel my love cut back up because I was on mm-hmm. some BS and making my own personal mistakes and journey in life. And there's so many losses or things that are lessons that I was going to service um, just to feel good, just to be filled up. And then you always got the wheels in my head turning and made me like really look at myself, reassess how I was showing up in the world, my relationship with God, and then actually like becoming the kind of person that I wanted to attract. So I um, credit you for a lot of that. Um, My husband can probably thank you too. Um, (laughs) But I want to give my big ups to you. Um, Super excited for your book. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, You guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my IG at spicy Mari. Go to the spicylife.com. Click and subscribe. Share this episode with a friend or loved one. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.